You're listening to audio from The Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about The Village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Good morning. All right, so feel free to open up your Bibles with me. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 2 this morning reading verses 27 through 36. If for some reason you do not have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Just go see the Connect desk after the service and they'll hook you up with one. And um, the Lord rejects Eli's household. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I might eat a morsel of bread. This is the word of the Lord. You all can be seated and my Scott will come at this time to give us the message. Good morning. 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 My name is Scott. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. That was supposed to be our Baptism Sunday focal passage. Isn't that like real encouraging? Isn't that fun? Uh, A couple things real quick. Uh, One, yeah, um, Rick, the Lord promised not to flood the earth. I don't know what he said about under the earth. And so technically it's maybe he's right to, you know, make this place filled with water. Uh, Also, I just want to say um, thank you uh, to like dozens of people part of this family, part of this community who uh, just made it possible for us to even be here today. Um, And it's not about like, oh gosh, we could have missed another week of some event that we come and hang out and see things happen and whatever. Like it would would be another week where we wouldn't be able to be together. Um, We wouldn't see each other's faces and get to sing together and sit under the word together and encourage each other and pray for each other. And so this isn't just about like, hey, let's like work really hard so that we can have this event on Sunday. But like, Man, you guys poured out generosity, blood, sweat, tears, uh, all the things to, to make it possible for us just to be here today. Um, and so if you would, like, join me in prayer as we begin, um, that the Lord would bless this time uh, that he has made possible for us to be here uh, once again. So join me in prayer. God, thank you for, for this space. Um, thank you for a, a place to gather where you've called your people, your, your sons and your daughters, us as brothers and sisters, um, to sit under the word, to, to be invited to your table, um, and to be reminded of your, your goodness and your grace towards us. Uh, we have, I have no idea what you're going to do today. Um, showed up here, all of us, I'm sure, with things that we, we want to see happen, that we want you to do, expectations of what you might show up and accomplish today, or what you might make someone think of, and, and there might be some things in us that we're like, I hope... Uh, I hope you don't bring this up. I hope this doesn't get illuminated or called out. Um, we don't know what you're going to do, and, and that is the best thing, and we can trust that and rest in that, God, because your, your purposes are good. We have a faithful high priest in Jesus who mediates your grace for us, who covers every sin, 
who tends to, to every wound, who comforts every suffering, who prays for us and goes in and out uh, before your presence on our behalf, that we might know that we are yours, that we belong, that we are forgiven, that we are reconciled, that we are loved and treasured and cherished. And God, I pray that this morning uh, that you would be big, um, that as we walk through this focal passage that might not seem the most encouraging, that we would be encouraged by your faithfulness and commitment to grace and seeing the purposes of your plans uh, through all the way to the end. So do your work in us today. Thanks for being a good dad. Thanks for the spirit who is in us and with us today. And thanks for Jesus uh, who is ruling and reigning. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, put a picture up on the screen. Uh, I think nine years ago. Don't do that. You'll make me cry. And I haven't said anything yet. Uh, Kel and I, we, we packed up our only three kids at the time into that black van. And uh, we took a trip to Oxford, to the, the bike shop up in Oxford, um, to get Mabel, who is our daughter there, uh, oldest, a, a real bike uh, for the first time in her life. And so we drove up there, uh, got the bike or whatever, and then we needed some stuff. And so like, you know, helmet, the little bike bell, all of that, that you've got to have all the things, the streamers, all the fun stuff. So we went to Walmart in Oxford uh, just to get a couple of things. So we do that, go in, we check out, uh, head back to the van, and, and we had been out for a little while. Um, we had probably like missed nap time, uh, maybe snack time, probably both uh, in some way. So we'd been out for a while. I don't remember, but it was uh, a bit of a struggle to get everyone actually back into the van, um, into their seat, buckled into like the 17 point Air Force harnesses that you have to put little kids into uh, these days. And so, man, like there was probably some, some yelling and some kicking and screaming, the, uh, the arched back move, right, the kids do when trying to buck up, which is like the universal sign of defiance of anyone under one year old. Uh, and so, look, I'm, I'm a human, uh, I think. Uh, I, I get a little frustrated uh, at times. And so it's, it's probably past my nap time. It's probably past my snack time, probably hangry, maybe a little bit. Uh, and so I'm sure my, my voice gets louder, right? I'm getting a little frustrated. Probably looks like I'm wrestling an alligator as I'm hanging out like the side of my sliding door in the van. Uh, and, then, and then I see like through the open hatch uh, of our van, the, the trunk or whatever, um, as I'm attempting to like subdue a, a six month old in her car seat, um, I see this dark blue sedan pull up slowly behind the car and then and then just stop. It wasn't like mall security or anything like that. It wasn't the police. Um, it was just this older woman who just stopped and was like, like looking out her window, just observing and taking it all in. Uh, and so I, I get everyone buckled, uh, close the door, walk around the back to, to close the hatch. And I hear her car window like start to roll down the and I'm like, I'm ready to go. Like, I'm ready, I'm ready to fight. I, I've already lost Father of the Year Ward, right, at that point. Uh, I, I'm hungry. I'm running on adrenaline. I have nothing to lose. Uh, and so I'm just ready to go or whatever. And so she leans over towards her passenger side window, and she's like, oh, excuse me, sir. So I walk over. And, and she said, like, genuinely, like, as, as kindly and as sweetly as she could, it's like, the Lord just wanted me to tell you to rest in the mighty hand of God. That's what she told me. And so... My response, in an uncharacteristically blunt moment towards a stranger, I leaned down and I said, what does that mean? <laughs> a mix of anger and shame made me black out for probably the next five minutes that that was my reaction on the drive home. But I'm pretty sure she just repeated herself again, and I said, okay, and then they just, we just left. We left the Walmart parking lot together. Um, to this day, I, I still don't know what she exactly was meaning to tell me or what I was supposed to take away from that. I'm still thinking about it, obviously. But, but one thing I do know, if the Lord really did spur some lady in Walmart in the parking lot to confront me in my parenting failure, she was right and he was right to do so. And I get it, like parents dealing with a kid's meltdown in aisle nine or like any of that stuff, that's the last thing you need. When, when your kid, uh, you take them to the grocery store and like you need you know, people side eyeing you and the way you're parenting or not parenting your kid, the glare, the comments from strangers, like that stuff probably not from the Lord most of the time. And yet when we're off, when what's shaping our words and our thoughts and our actions and our motives in any given moment, especially when what we are doing is spilling out onto the people around us, like when those things aren't shaped by God's grace, then God himself 
doesn't just have the right to say something to us about it, but his commitment to seeing grace protect his people and preserve his people and advance his purposes to all people through his people, that commitment to seeing grace through to the end means that he can and will step in to act if and when we let his grace stop with us. And so today we're, we're going to see the Lord confront a dad about the way he's parenting or not parenting his kids and how even though they've been the recipients of much grace, they are not living as if they believe that what they have actually is grace, as if it's a gift and it's spilling out onto God's people in a way that he just won't put up with. So the main idea this morning is this, that God steps into the plans he makes to fulfill the purposes of his grace. And we'll start by looking at the first few verses in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 27 through 29. It says this, uh, There came a man to God, or of God, to Eli, and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? First point this morning is this, that God doesn't let us forget about grace so we'll set this up a little bit. Um, I know we weren't around in person last week. Uh, hopefully most of you caught the sermon. Some of you I'm sure didn't. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, Eli, <clears throat> it's the guy that this anonymous man of God is, is confronting. He was one of God's priests. His whole family had been priests. It was a, it was a family business of sorts because that's kind of how God divided up the work and the responsibilities among his people. So a, a long, long time ago, back in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, God gave one of the 12 tribes of his people, the tribe of Levi, the role of being his priests, which was a, a very important job. If, if you think of prophets, like the man of God that we see uh, here, they, they spoke to God on behalf, uh, or spoke to people on behalf of God. Priests were the flip of that. They went to God on behalf of the people. They helped folks draw near to God. They have folks offer sacrifices for sin or thanksgiving or whatever. Uh, one of the priests was even given the job of, of wearing special clothes. It's what the ephod uh, is that you hear about that weird word. Uh, it was laced with gold and gems that had all the names of uh, all the tribes engraved on them. And so he would walk right up into the presence of God once a year wearing that uh, to make an offering that would cover the sins of all the people. All of that, that's a pretty big deal. Because a, a priest's job, if they do it right, lets a perfectly holy God live among perfectly sinful people. The, the priests kept God and his grace close at hand. They helped people experience the assurance of God's forgiveness of sin, God's removal of their shame, God's declaration when they were finally clean and like able to gather once again with God's people. They helped folks give thanks and offer prayers, they taught, they sang. Uh, sometimes they were supposed to be experts in the ways and the grace of God, mediating God's presence in the lives of God's people. So this was Eli's job, and this was Eli's son's job, two of them, Hophni and Phinehas. And they were like, they were terrible at it. They did not do a very good job. And it wasn't just that they were like clumsy or forgetful or lazy or something like that. They weren't bad at doing good things. They were really good at doing bad things, right? And so like they weren't just bad at helping offer sacrifices for sin. They were the ones doing the sinning. They weren't just bad at helping people give thanks. They were stealing what people had brought to give thanks to the Lord. It was public knowledge that, that Eli's sons slept with women at the temple they took the best portions of God's sacrifices for themselves, and they threatened to kill anyone who started to roll down the passenger side window of their car to say something about it, literally. So imagine showing up to a church, because there's supposed to be something of God, right, in, in the people of God, right? And so uh, asking for prayer, looking for assurance, wanting to, to know how to be made right with the Lord, and what meets you 
are men who simply want to take what you have. Your time, your money, your talents, your body, whatever it is that you brought before the Lord, instead of making known the grace of God, they just say, hey, give it to me. All right, this is how we do things here. This is, what, this is what God wants. What does that do to a person? What does that do to a community or a church community? What does it do to anybody in that city or around that city looking for Jesus who happens to come through those doors? Some of us don't have to imagine that. That's real life right here and now for some people. And that was Eli's sons. That's, that's what they were doing. And Eli knew it, and everyone else knew it, and Eli knew that everyone knew about that stuff. And so what we saw in last week's passage was Eli confronting his sons about all this stuff, but it was pretty weak. All right, you probably know parents, and look, Parents, every kid is different, all right? Every, every kid is different. You got to do what works for your particular kids. There's not one way to, to raise uh, a good human. Even parents who have the same kids disagree on how to raise kids, right, and what to do in any situation. And yet there are parents who will watch their kids, like, drag other kids by the hair right down the hallway who will, like, watch as their kids light the cat on fire or slash the neighbor's tire or whatever. And they'll just be like, hey, sweetie, you really shouldn't do that. Like, okay, honey. And kid's like, okay, mom. And then three seconds later, like, you know, sweetie is, is drawing all over your wedding photos or whatever. Like, that, that's a real thing. If that's your kid getting drug, right, or your cat getting lit on fire, or your wedding photos getting scribbled on, like, that's probably not an acceptable response, right, from that parent. And so, man, that is what is happening here. That's the underwhelming response that Eli had over his sons disgracing the name and the people of God. And that's just not acceptable. And so, because Eli failed to do what he should have done, God steps in. And this is where we, we pick up today. The Lord sends some guy. He's not even named. Uh, he's not Eli's boss. As far as we know, he's not anybody significant. Samuel, whoever was writing this, like years down the road, was like, hey, did anybody remember what that guy's name was? And everyone's like, I don't know. You know but, but here he is. Like he showed up because the Lord gave him words to say to Eli. And what does this guy lead with? When he starts talking, does God send him in like, you know, kick down the door, guns blazing, like firing off every failure that Eli's ever committed or all the ways that he's terrible at his job? No, he doesn't do that. Before anything else, this prophet asks this priest to trace the grace of God that has shaped everything about his life. God asks, wasn't I the one who came knocking on your family's door? Right? And told you, your family, who I was when your ancestors were still slaves in another country to another God, to Pharaoh? Isn't that how this relationship started? Wasn't I the one who picked your tribe, Eli, and your family in that tribe, out of all the tribes, out of all the families, to do this job? Aren't I the reason that you have a position of splendor and honor among my people? Haven't I shared with you my offerings? Like all the sacrifices that my people bring me, isn't that how you eat? Isn't that why you don't have to go get like a, a second job or beg or borrow or steal or whatever? Like, aren't I the one, Eli, who has given you your life? God retraces his grace, not just through Eli's life, but through his whole family tree. But why? Like, why would God begin a prophetic confrontation against wickedness and abuse and sin by reminding Eli of his grace on him? There's a couple reasons. First is this, that grace is just where everything begins. Everyone receives grace. You don't exist apart from grace. You don't exist. Just so you know what I mean when I say grace, because I've said that word like a thousand times, or I will say it many more times throughout the sermon. Here's what I mean when I say the word grace. Grace is getting something good that you simply don't deserve. You didn't earn it. You didn't bargain for it. You're not owed it. It wasn't agreed upon in some way, indebted to you at all. It's something that someone wanted to bless you with simply because they wanted to. Grace is the, it's the, it's the purest form of a gift. And that includes our very existence. When and where you were born. Anything at all good in your life. Even if we worked for it, right, we were only able to work for it because the Lord made it possible for us to work for it, and he didn't need to do that for us. Grace is the starting place for every good thing, and that includes 
our relationship with him. That's true for Eli. God came knocking on his family's door while they belonged to someone else. He made Eli's family a part of his family. He gave him purpose and he provided for him. And the exact same thing is also true for us. When you think of how your relationship with with the Lord began, whatever that looks like, if you have one, like when you retrace God's grace in your life, it doesn't matter how hard or how long you think you were knocking on his door. For me, that was years that I thought I was knocking on his door, right? But God had been knocking on all of our doors long before we ever saw him in the doorway, long before we ever even had a conscious thought like fire off in our brain. Anyone who's ever gone looking for the Lord never really knew what they were looking for until he decided to reveal himself And that's where the relationship began. And so God initiates this this confrontation over sin with someone that we might look at and say like, oh man, dude, like why did he get all of this stuff? He didn't deserve any of this stuff. And by retracing his grace, letting us see that, God wants to remind us, yes, that's the point. He didn't deserve this and neither do you and neither do I. The point is that simply God is that gracious to everyone. Like we, we are nothing without him. And whatever part of us might be offended by that, that might offend some of us this morning that we're nothing apart from God's grace, that's the part of us that needs to be confronted today. Right? That, that's what we're doing here. We get to let God expose in us some of our pride that shows up when we hear about grace. Michael talked a few weeks ago about how suffering can reveal where our heart finds rest and peace and worship. Well, guess what? Like, so can grace. Grace reveals that as well. The story that we tell ourselves about how or why anyone has what they have in their life, that, that is very revealing about our hearts. And we should let the Lord step into that. Because the part of us that's offended by grace is the part of us that thinks too highly of ourselves too little of the Lord and and not enough about how freedom and purpose and life itself is actually found in accepting that we were created dependent on things that we've never deserved from someone that we have zero leverage over instead of things that we can do or buy or claim. And the crazy thing is we couldn't even be offended by our need for grace if it wasn't for the grace of God that we're offended by but we forget that. Our pride can't let ourselves believe it, when in reality, grace is something that no one in this room, no one you will ever meet can ever escape the grace of God. And it should change everything about the way that we live and view this life. And that's the second thing, is that grace is meant to be believed. That's why God starts here. Why then, Eli, If all your life is is my grace, why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel? When God asks this question, he's letting us know that grace has a purpose. And it's given on purpose. Whatever you receive from the Lord, it's not accidental. It is meant to have an intended effect upon you. You're not meant to simply receive it, but to believe that what you're receiving is a gift, like from the greatest of gift givers. It's not a bit of luck that just happens to come your way. Every good thing is a gift from the creator of the universe. Sylvester Stallone's been in town, right? Been around the block a little bit here recently. Like, dude, what if Sylvester Stallone, who's, who's been around, like, or, or Mr. Beast, or Joanna Gaines, or whoever the thing is, the person is in your brain that would be, ah, oh, I would love to meet them. What if they showed up at your door and they gave you something, a, a prop from Rocky, right? Or a candy bar or some shiplap, right, to put up somewhere. Like, whatever. Like, you would know that that's a gift. Immediately, you would recognize that that is a gift because they went out of their way to come to your house to give you something they thought that you would like or that you need. The God of of heaven, the God of heaven woke you up this morning. We're breathing his air through the mouths that he gave us into the lungs that he put into us. The coffee that you might be drinking right now, the dry seat that you're sitting on, 
the Bible in your hand, what are they for? What's it for? Surely not to simply receive it and just let it all pass us by as if, if this is just how things should be. This is just the way things are. This is what it gets to be. And this is what it is only by the grace of God. God gave grace to Eli for at least one purpose in particular, honor. He expected grace to produce honor for the Lord and Eli, but not as payback, right? Not to pay him back for his grace, otherwise it wouldn't be grace, wouldn't be a gift. But, but if he believes that his whole life is from God and about God, how could God not be the one he honors most? In his family, in his job, in everything. God doesn't just deserve honor. It's not just right, but, but the natural response to believing in grace is to honor the Lord in thanks. That should be true of, of us. But for Eli, he honors his sons more. And we can be like, well, yeah, but like he did, he did confront them, right? He talked about this stuff with them last week. He said, yeah, like I clearly doesn't like what they're doing. And sure, gr grace gets to be for his sons too. But the thing is that grace has been for them, right? And, and they've been willing to receive it, but there is no evidence at all that they believe it. In fact, there's lots of evidence to the contrary of that. And so grace, yes, absolutely. But honor, more than the Lord, absolutely not. Honoring the Lord shows up in a lot of different ways, but it shows up here in one specific way, and that's in the sin that we're willing to tolerate. What sin you're willing to let go tells you who you honor most. You can tell your kid all day long that you wish he would stop lighting the cat on fire, but until you're willing to do something about it, you're letting it happen. You might be saying with your words that it's not okay, but you're, you're saying with your actions or your inaction, no, it's okay, go for it. This is permissible. That is honoring your kid, respecting his wishes, his purposes, his desires over anything else, certainly the cats and certainly whoever owns the cat, right? Is there unrepentant sin, sin that, that you simply cannot put down, that you can't seem to turn away from? It, is there that unrepentant sin in your life or in the life of a brother or a sister that you are allowing to go unaddressed? Who do you need to confront so that someone might not forget the grace of God in their life, but actually come to believe it for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time? God is not calling us to be intolerant, okay? Nitpicky, watching over everyone's life, pulling the trigger all the time. He is calling us to integrity. If God's people remember that they get to receive and believe the grace of God, then, then we will together, we will honor the Lord by not tolerating unrepentant sin, especially from our leaders. And listen, like that's not graceless. That is not graceless. Stepping into situations to confront grace or to confront sin actually is grace. And that's what we get to see in our next part here. We're gonna look at the next few verses, 30 through 33. This is what the man of God continues with. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. That's not because everyone's gonna be young forever, okay? Just so we're clear. That's not what he means there. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. Second point this morning is that God doesn't let us live without consequence. So uh, we have five kids now, not three, we have five now. Uh, they are all in school. I have this job. I'm involved as a regular old church member, whatever, volunteer with stuff in the city. Kelly, my wife, uh, she works part-time. She's in school part-time. She's on parent-teacher council stuff. She leads stuff here in the church. She moms full-time, right? And so we live by a Google calendar, 
Right? That, that's our life. That's where that exists. And, and the perpetual questions from our family always, hey, so what are we doing today? Are, are we going anywhere? Are we doing anything? Hey, what's for dinner? Are we do anything after dinner? Can we watch anything? Go anywhere? What are we doing? You know, and so like, okay, like our calendar is our life. Uh, but, but the calendar doesn't always predict the future very well when we're answering those questions. We've been burned. Kelly and I have been burned so many times when we give an answer that is even slightly maybe definitive and then our plans have to change, right? That, that most of the time our default's like, uh, maybe we're going to do that. Oh, uh, maybe. What's for, uh, what's for dinner? I, I don't know. It's breakfast time. I'm not, we haven't thought about dinner yet, even though there's probably a dinner calendar on the kitchen or whatever. I don't know. Because if we say yes, like we are going to do this thing, we might have every intention and plan of actually moving in that direction as a family, uh, but then the car doesn't start. Someone gets sick, or the 210 floods, or the sermon's not done on Saturday, right? And so that, that changes things. Plans have to change because something hasn't worked out the way that we wanted. And understandably, right, the kids are, are bummed, or they're mad. They're like, oh, man, I thought you said we were going to do that, right? And so we, like, preface every plan that we share and choose our words very carefully, right, so as to minimize their potential disappointment and so that we're not held hostage to plans that we made before things that happened that, like, we could never predict or control. So when situations change... The plans that are best for our family collectively, those things might have to change too. I was talking to Mabel, uh, our oldest daughter, earlier this week, the, the bike girl, um, and, and this passage came up we were talking about. She was like, hey, so like, I thought God kept his promises and stuff. It's like a good question. That, that's what I thought when I first read it too. It's like, okay, well, uh, yeah, like God promises a thing to a family. And then he's like, meh, second thought, never mind. Like, I'm going to change direction on that, right? And again, this is supposed to be Baptism Sunday. Welcome to the family, right? It, 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 rejoicing in the promises and covenant of God. Also like, eh, well, we just read a thing where he's cutting people out of the family, all right? How does that work? But what's going on here is, is promise. Like, the word promise is the strongest way you could translate the, the Hebrew here for God's original plans for Eli's family. The CSB just says that the Lord said that Eli's family would be the ones going in and out. It was a plan, like serving as God's priest forever. That was a plan. It wasn't a promise. It was a plan. But either way you slice it, God told Eli, right, that his plan was for his family to be his priest forever, and now he's telling him they're out. And in a sermon where, where we're talking a lot about grace today, uh, getting a good thing you don't deserve, this might feel a bit contrary to that whole idea, but it's not. This, cutting Eli out of the family, his whole family out, this is actually the most gracious thing that he could do. I want to make three things really clear, some theological points of clarity. One, God does not change. He's not flippant. He doesn't do things willy-nilly. He does not evolve uh, or grow or learn over time. He never comes up with a better idea that he never thought of before. That's not what's happening here. He didn't realize something new about Eli or his sons. Like, that's not what happened. And then have to, like, come up with a, a plan B. He knew this all along. We change. Everything in the created universe changes. Nothing stays the same except the Lord. And yet sometimes the Lord, who, who never changes, does change his plans. He never abandons his purposes. He doesn't break any of his promises but he does change his plans, at least from our perspective. Like, not because he's different, right? But because the eternal purposes and designs and destiny that he has set in stone before the foundation of the world, he has to unfold those, like, one second at a time to people with three-pound brains who change their mind on stuff from day to day, right? It might like, look like to us that he is shooting from the hip, Sometimes, when in reality, he has been waiting in eternity to unfold the very next thing to us and with us in time, right next to us. We can't see the future as we are making plans. God very much can. He's the one making it. Right? And his plans account for all of it, but our brains would melt if we saw his Google calendar. Right? We just simply couldn't handle it. God doesn't change. And God can change his plans. That's number two. This might make some of you a little uncomfortable, all right, that, that God might change how he makes his purposes come to pass. And it, and it might be uncomfortable because you have a high view of God's sovereignty, which is a, a fancy way of saying that God's in charge, right? He's the top dog or whatever. He has authority. Uh, 
But if that's true, like if, if that is why we are uncomfortable with this, then the problem that we might have with passages like this isn't that we have too high a view of God's sovereignty. It might be that it's too low. It's not high enough. Being able to, to make decisions, to change your mind, to do what you want, all of that stuff is, is baked into what it means to be sovereign. Kings get to decide what they want for dinner. I bet they get to change their mind too and send the entree back when they don't like it. Kings get to decide how high the taxes are going to be, who lives or who dies. And so we can't, like in the name of being concerned about God's sovereignty, rob him of his ability to call shots. God is sovereign. And because he is, he can fire the family that he hired when it seems like it's not working out. He can do that. And that's the key word here is that he, he can. He doesn't have to. Number three, we, we can't force God to change his plans. That's the third thing. We, we can't make him do anything. We can't hold him hostage. We can't bargain with him, threaten him. We have no leverage over him to make him do a dang thing any different. Eli didn't make God fire his family. He didn't make him do that. He's not that powerful. And so don't read this as if God didn't have like any other choice. He could have just left things as they were. Left Eli and his sons and his son's sons for, for generation after generation. Could have let them keep their jobs to keep getting fat on the Lord's grace, to starve the people of it. Spiritual abuse, like that was their failure. That was their sin, not God's. He has no obligation to step into the good plans that he made a long time ago just because someone else screwed it up down the line. And yet, he does. It's exactly what he does. Not because he has to, but because he can and not because he's changed, but because he remained committed to seeing the purposes of grace through to the end, to his people, among his people, and through them to the world. His choice was his grace. God saw that his family's situation had changed, and so he decided to, to step in with a better plan that would better serve his whole family. Cutting off Eli's family was the most gracious thing that he could do, which sounds crazy, when you read what's going to happen, like no one's gonna to live to an old age. They're gonna die young, they're gonna die violently. And any stragglers who survive will only live in order to grieve the loss of what they once had. It's pretty brutal. And this highlights a theme here. Grace does not mean lawlessness. It's an important distinction. Grace does not mean lawlessness. Accountability among the people of God is not a graceless act. It's a gift. It can be full of grace, especially like when it happens before there are weeks or months or years or generations of sin and suffering and the hardening of hearts. That's clearly not the case with Eli and his sons, right? It's been going on for a long time. But, but that can be true for any of God's people. For here at the village, it can be true for us here. And here's what I mean. Here's how this gets to be grace for us. It gets to be grace to the sinners. Sin is the fruit of unbelief. And so to confront someone in sin is to call them to repent and to believe either for the first time or for the first time in a long time. And let's be clear, this is not a bad thing. Sin is a bad thing. Unrepentant sin, sin that goes unchecked and uncared for, like that's an even worse thing. But it is never a bad thing. And it is always a good thing when God shows up on his own or through a brother or sister in Christ to remind someone of the truth of who he is and who they are and how they get to live now. There is nothing but more forgiveness and more freedom and more maturity to be experienced on the other side of all that stuff. Like that, it's truly a priestly duty that we get to do. And to not do that for someone, to not hold someone accountable or to confront someone who's gone off the rails isn't being gracious. It's actually withholding grace and the experience of grace for that person in Christ. Secondly, accountability is grace to the sufferers. It's probably self-explanatory, but, but for anyone on the receiving end of sin, confronting sin that has already happened can prevent future sin, right, that hasn't happened yet. God's church shouldn't need to suffer any longer than it takes for folks to actually see what's happening. And it's dignifying to show someone that they are worth protecting and worth speaking up for. When someone sins against another person, they are declaring something untrue 
about them. It's preaching a false gospel, that they are less a person, less of an image bearer than they really are. And if the church refuses to step in, those people can then start to believe that about themselves, and the church is saying, yeah, maybe that's true about you, on top of whatever other harm might be happening. But confronting sin is a grace to the sufferer that preaches something more true, a true gospel to those who are victims. Accountability is a grace to the church, right? Even for those who who aren't directly impacted by whatever sin uh, might be there, confronting sin, it communicates to the whole church that there is safety, there's maturity, there's integrity to be found within the flock. Churches have sin. There are wolves among the sheep. We are all still in the process of growing and maturing and being sanctified in Christ. The Bible tells us all that stuff, that that's to be expected, that is normal in the church. It's not about whether or not there's sin to be confronted. It's about whether or not the church will confront it. The church doesn't protect its members by, by, caring, about it, by caring about its reputation, hiring a PR firm, a law firm, right? Non-disclosure agreements. The church protects its members by caring about the reputation of Jesus who lets us shine light on every ugly thing and yet still walk in hope. And then lastly, like accountability, it's grace to the world. To see a church deal rightly with sin, to care about the morality that we claim to hold and preach, to walk in integrity and not in cover-ups. It's a grace to the watching world. It's refreshing. If you can imagine, hey, fun election year, right? If you hear a, a, a politician admit that he was wrong just once, that's a good point. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. How refreshing would that be? Or to concede that the other guy might actually have a good point about something. Oh, that would feel very refreshing. Or to just even answer the yes or no question that they were asked in a debate. Hey, that would be very surprising. And so look, like it's an even greater grace to the world when the body of Christ is vindicated, not as perfect, but as caring enough about the right things and trusting enough in Jesus that he is sufficient for us to be honest and to be above reproach. So for all those reasons and about a million more, it's, it, it is God's grace when he doesn't let us live without consequence. And the consequences of believing that and actually letting God through us towards other people or in us about our own stuff, when we let him step into his plans and into our plans, that actually advances the purposes of grace. It doesn't slow them down. It does not stop them when we expose that stuff or hold people accountable. We don't have to avoid accountability. In fact, we get to embrace it as a gift that lets us and the church and the world experience more of God's grace. We'll move on to the last closing portion of our passage today. This is 34 through 36. And this that shall come to pass upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what's in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who's left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and shall say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Here's the third point this morning, is that God doesn't let us wonder where we stand. My memory really, it genuinely, my memory goes dark for like the first few minutes after that like Walmart park, parking lot exchange. And, and it's probably because like being called out like that, besides being hangry and tired and all the things, being called out unexpectedly in public, like when I'm already riled up about stuff, gosh, like it just, it just rattled me. It got me all worked up. My thoughts were all over the place. And now this is probably oversimplifying, but there's probably like three kinds of people in the aftermath of confrontation. One, you're someone like me who like just turn it over in their head for the next 12 months and don't stop thinking about it, trying to figure out what really happened and what was that and what if I said this and what did they mean when they did this thing or like tilted their head that way or whatever, like what's going on there? And then there are people who like just confidently believe they nailed it, right? No self-reflection required. 
right? That was fine. That went exactly as I wanted it to go. And then the third group of people is those who just immediately go to sleep and never want to think about it again, right? Those are probably the three kinds of people in the aftermath of, of confrontation. Regardless of which category might be most fitting for you, like we all want to know at the end of the day where we stand. Might be afraid to hear it, but we all want to know where we stand. Am I in the right the wrong? Am I good with this other person? How should I now proceed with my life? Like my response to the lady who rolled down her window, like we legit want to know what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What am I supposed to do with that, right? What, what, what does this mean with the things that were said? Like we get to wonder about that stuff and we cannot shake the thought. like what does this mean? But when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, he doesn't leave it up to us to wonder about what he meant or where we stand. Accountability and confrontation, conviction over sin, like when we have a healthy view of these things, they shouldn't rattle our confidence in where we stand with the Lord or even with each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. Like those things should be clarifying. They should be illuminating right? Shining light on stuff. It might take us off guard, might be bewildering in the moment, but here's the thing. The Lord has given us a sure sign of a faithful priest who mediates God's grace for for your sin, for my sin, for other people's sin, for God's presence every single time, in every single situation, for all of time, freely. He does that as a gift. There's going to be stuff to deal with in our relationship with God and with other people. Stuff that we have to let him step into. But so long as we are letting him step into that, we're letting him deal with it, our sin and our lack of immaturity or somebody else's or our foolishness, it doesn't have to threaten a relationship that began and continues forever by his grace. Our standing with God is not at stake if we have a priest who stands faithful and who can stand forever. And this is the promise that God makes in this last section. He's not just firing Eli's family, but he's hiring someone else who will be the faithful priest that they never were. And, and that happens in the short term. There's a new priest from a different family named uh, Zadok who shows up after Solomon, who's like David's kid, becomes king. But God fulfills this promise in the long term for good in Jesus Christ. But he also gives us another future sign in this text, this this anonymous man of God ends his rebuke of Eli with a sign that the Lord means business. He will know that the Lord is serious about cutting his family off when his two sons die on the same day. When that happens, Eli can be confident that these words from this unnamed stranger are in fact true. And so we approach our time of, of response, responding to whatever it is that God may have been stirring in you, what he brought to mind in you, what you don't want to hear, we get to approach our time with a choice. Two priesthoods are set before us, and we can pick one, one, to define our relationship with the Lord and to deal with our sin. We can pick the faithful one who will care more about God's reputation, dealing honestly and fully with our sin in community with the church and letting God grow us and mature us into the purposes of his grace. Or we can pick the one that's concerned with, with our pride and our reputation and getting to do whatever we want with whatever it is that God has given us, even if it robs others and the Lord. We can pick the one who will stay in God's grace and whose house will last forever. Or we can pick the one whose house is destined to die outside the grace of God. We can choose to honor the Lord or we can choose to honor someone else. We can choose to live or we can choose to die. Our choices are Jesus, God's high priest who not only like helps us deal with our sin, but who paid for it all himself or ourselves. There is no third option. There's not a third option. And there's only one mediator between God and man and it's, it's not us. 
We can't bargain with him. We can't negotiate. We literally have no leverage. Anything that we'd offer is something that he already gave to us in the first place, something that he put into our hands. But the good news is that God stepped into the plans that he made to fulfill the purposes of his grace for us, where Eli and every priest could never fully give us what we needed to make us fully right with God. God sent his son to take our place in life and in death to become our priestly sacrifice for our sin and to become our priest himself as the one who stands between us and God that we might know where we stand with him once and for all. Jesus alone gives us full assurance of forgiveness, the removal of shame, the declaration that we are clean, we belong, we can gather, we can be part of the church, we are wanted among the people of God. And that choice is set before everyone. If you feel like you're, you're begging for a morsel of grace, a loaf of bread, or for a place at his table, the Lord today invites you to join him at his table. Van, you guys can come back up. For anybody who will believe upon the grace of God that Jesus saves, that he is sufficient, that he is enough, you get to belong. And his purposes get to be fulfilled in you and you get to see that through forever. And so the invitation to all of you, if you're in Christ, is to come to the table. And you don't have to beg or plead. You simply get to trust in Christ who did the work for you. And so I want to encourage you all as we move into this time of response, consider what the Lord might be stirring in you. Did he confront you with something today? Is there someone that you need to confront? Is there sin that you need to repent of? Is there suffering in your life that you just simply need to bring before him? You get to examine where grace might be exposing pride in your life. Sit and stew on that. God's not stirring that up to crush you or condemn you. He wants you to experience grace in all those things. Sit with that, pray. You can pray at that prayer bench over there. Uh, my wife and I will be against that wall. We'd love to pray. There'll be some folks back there who would love to pray with you as well and talk with you that stuff. If you're in Christ, you are welcome to come to this table to enjoy body and juice that represents the, the body and blood of Jesus that was shed for you as a sacrifice and who now stands as your high priest before you and Lord that, that lets you come up and rejoice and, and be bold in the grace that he has offered to you that you belong and you get to sit at his table. You get to do that. And if you're not in Christ, this isn't for you yet, but we are for you and we would love to talk with you about Jesus. We would love to walk up with you today and take communion for the first time if you want to trust in Christ. You can sit in your seats. There'll be some questions on the screen. You can sing songs. However the Lord might stir you to respond today. Just encourage you. Listen to that. Trust that it is grace and God's good purpose in your life. And follow him. Step into it.